So we're going to pray real quick just because, because we love God and we want to hear from him. So, Father God, I thank you that today that you speak what you want to speak. Holy Spirit, come mightily so that we hear what you have to say, not what I have planned, but if there's anything that needs to change, Lord God, that you change it and do exactly what you want to do, not what I want or what I think. Let your thoughts surpass my thoughts, Lord God. And Father, I pray today that uh, there will be no offense to the word, because sometimes that happens. So I thank you today, Lord God, that you want to move and you want to change hearts. You want to change my heart. So I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'm going to start with a confession. So many times in the circle, the pre-service circle, or different times in my life, people will say to me, or say, you're faithful. They'll say how, you know, you're faithful, and uh, uh, I have a confession to make about that. The reason I'm faithful and I show up it's fear. <laughs> I have this fear that if I'm not here and God moves, I'm going to miss it. And so that drives me to the church because I don't want to miss it. And so this fear in me causes me to be faithful. So I praise God for that fear. So uh, I, was, uh, I surrendered my life to the Lord 27 years and seven months ago. And uh, I surrendered my life because my life was a disaster. Uh, there were things in my life that were not good, and I wasn't happy with my life. And I won't go into the details of the moment I surrendered, but it was all God, and I thank God for that. And so the minute I surrendered my life, it, it was a new adventure. I felt it. I knew it. Things that were in me or bothering me before or were... Uh, what I say, tormenting me before, were no longer tormenting me. And I was free, and it was new. And so I started going to this church. And um, uh, when I was there at this new church, of course, I'm newborn. You know, I don't know. I didn't figure out what my age was. It was right around 30-something, 30, 30. I don't know. Anyway, it had been 31. And um, <laughs> now you can figure that out. Um, <laughs> um I would go to this new church, and it was full gospel, you know, and there, we had an older gentleman as a pastor, and, and uh, I would hear things from the pulpit that would just excite me, and I just wanted it. I wanted all I could get because what was in my past, I didn't want back at all. I didn't ever want to go back to that place, and it wasn't that I was doing bad things. It was tormenting my mind, and so during that time, uh, in this church that I was at, um, they would talk about uh, these movements of God. They would talk about Toronto. They would talk about Pensacola because that was what was going on at that time. But being new, I didn't really understand what all that meant. I just, you know, was hungry for God, but I didn't know what movements of God meant or even things like that. But as I grew in the Lord and as I uh, um, had this desire uh, about a year after I was saved, there was this thing called uh, Washington for Jesus in 1996. And so it was a youth rally, but you know what? I was young in the Lord. So I uh, packed up my van with about six people, and we drove to Washington, D.C. We ended up parking on the top of Union Station, which is pretty cool, because from the top of Union Station, you can see a lot of Washington, D.C., and right from there, you could see the Capitol building. So we were there, uh, a group of us, uh, one that was quite a bit older, and then one a couple my age, and then a couple younger. But you know, we all went there with expectation. Uh, Ron Luce was there, if anybody knows who he is. He, he was a great youth uh, minister, still is. Uh, Kim Clement was there. Uh, Newsboys, Kirk Franklin were there. And so here we were, uh, six people from Ludington, Michigan, on the White House lawn, or the Capitol lawn, with about 250,000 other people. They estimated, you would look back at the, what is that thing, the where the reflection lake or whatever it is, you just seen people everywhere, the mall. And man, just, it was amazing. You felt unity. So here I am a year 
old in the Lord, and I'm experiencing this, this great thing going on, and people are just excited, and we slept on the lawn, and, and we, did, you know, we didn't have a place to stay, and I remember just lines and lines of outhouses, you know, the porta-potties, just lines and lines. They were everywhere, uh, thank God, because I had a little bladder infection or something going on. So <laughs> there, there was a little misery in, in that trip, but it was, it was so exciting to see. I, I don't know if I've ever seen 250,000 people in my life before that and since. So it was pretty cool to be there. And so what that did in me was it ignited a passion. It ignited a passion for the things of God, and I wanted to know more. Shortly after that, I moved to another church, and then this other church uh, was a great, the lady was a great teacher, and uh, but they talked a lot about past revivals. They talked a lot about um, movements of God there, things I didn't know. And so I began to learn that stuff, and that excited me. And so here I am, you know, even there, I didn't want to miss, well, I went there, they were in a little building uh, out in the country, just a little tiny old uh, like a, a township hall. It was small. And so I started going there. It was close to my home. And I went in, and <laughs> I came in right after they actually had a move of God. So they had these tent meetings where people were getting healed, people were getting delivered, people were seeing Jesus. And so I'm hearing these stories, and I came in right after it. <laughs> so of course, of course, here I am going, well, goodness, you know, maybe it'll happen again. I, you know, I, I don't want to miss because if it happens again, I don't want to miss my day of visitation. You know, I want to be there. And so that's been kind of the, um, the, uh, the uh, direction of my life since I got saved. Um, so I, I long even now to see the move of God. Um, I'm still in great anticipation. I'm, um, I'm, I just can't wait to see what God is going to do. We see it in little bits and pieces here and there. We see, you know, we see people healed, which is amazing. We see people get delivered, but that's different in a move of God. Not that I've experienced it, but that I've heard. And so for me, that gives me just the drive, the fear to keep going and not stop. Um, so it, myself... I've read books. There's many books out on past revivals. There's many videos, and you can watch them, you can read them, and that'll spark a fire in you. I have to say, though, back then when, there, when a move of God would happen under some of these men uh, that would preach, they preached hellfire and brimstone, man. You, it, when people repented, they repented because they had a fear of hell, you know? And nowadays, the movement is love, and God is moving in that, that way. And so God... God's moves, you have to shift with God's move. Not that some people, it says in, I think, Jude, that some people are won by the love of God and some people are won by the fear of hell. So you just have to know when each person. Um, so then after being in that church, uh, I prayed for a long time and God moved me here. And you know, the thing is, is I'm still desiring the move of God a greater revival. I want to see this move that God's going to do. So he moves me to a church in Manistee, which many of you know I live in Pentwater. So it's a, it's a distance to drive, but it's okay because the Spirit of God is here. And uh, he puts me under a pastor that I didn't know at the time, had a word that uh, was given to her in a meeting that said, and this was years ago, Go home and prepare for revival. Now, I didn't know that when I moved here, but when I heard that, it excited me. Well, then, just recently, you've all heard the story. We're in a conference, and someone who was a key person in the Pensacola revival imparted to Pastor Joyce. She's gotten gifts that all speak of revival. She's gotten all these things that speak of revival. And so it excites me more. So I know that God has placed me right where he wants me because there's this great anticipation of what's coming, okay? I hope that you all feel the same way. Um, Jeremiah 3.15, I want to go there. Jeremiah 3.15 
And I am not here to lift up a person. But sometimes we grow so familiar with what we have that we forget. And we need to be reminded. So in Jeremiah 3.15, 868 is the page number if uh, you needed to know that. All the Bibles are the same if you need one. It says, and I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So I personally know that Pastor Joyce is after the heart of God. I know personally that she has supernatural knowledge that I don't have. Come in here, I heard things I never heard before. And I've been saved a long time, over 20 years when I came here. But I heard things I never heard before because it comes out by the Spirit. And so then the understanding part. So she gives the knowledge, but she gives the understanding by practical um, experiences she's had. And, and so we are blessed here. And God is going to move here. Um, but I just want to let you know that revival, because that's what I want to talk about today is revival, because that's a passion of mine. And so revival happens in our hearts, okay? Um, I have to ask a question, and this is where I prayed, please, no offense. So how many were here Thursday? All right, now just raise your hand, don't yell it out. How many remember what was preached on Thursday? All right. So sometimes we get in a routine of coming to church and just listening to a message and going home. How does your heart change in that? So it's important when we're here to receive what's being said. What's amazing to me is you hear, if you will watch um, or, or if you write down titles or you write down what's in the message, you'll see a theme going on. And I watch that because I'm ready for the move of God. <laughs> and so recently, uh, Thursday, she, sp she spoke on stirring up the gifts and stirring up passion and stirring up love and stirring up all these things. Recently, she talked about the narrow gate. How many remember that one? We need to choose the narrow gate. If we want revival, we have to choose the narrow gate. All right. She uh, recently spoke about uh, poking holes in the ashes. All right, we need to stir up that fire. Some of us, are, our fires has dwindled a little bit, and we need to stir that up. So she preached on that. She preached on being trimmed to grow. Uh, sometimes God has to trim things off so that we can grow. So there's a theme in all of this. It's preparing our hearts for revival. Um, again, revival happens in our hearts. It's not something that happens outside. It happens in our hearts. So what happens is um, sometimes our hearts... Uh, become dull and they need to come alive again and that's what God is trying to do right now in this season I love your testimony there Karen uh, other testimonies about just this passion to to reach out to people you know that's what God is looking for he wants our hearts revived so that we can help other people um, what happens when our hearts are revived we start wanting to spend time with God we start wanting to listen to worship music Sometimes, spontaneously, we'll just sing out a worship song. We'll want to pray. We'll just want to sit in his presence. We'll want to assemble. When our hearts are revived, these are all things we want. And so it's important that uh, we, the Bible says, to examine ourselves to see where we're at. And, you know, there might be one area I'm revived in, and there might be an area I'm dead in. And so I need to examine myself to see where that area is so that I can come back alive, revive in that area. Um, so when God revives a person's heart, he's bringing them back to the original place he intended them to be. It's the world that causes us to get pulled away. It's the enemy, the thief that actually wants us pulled away. So in uh, Psalms 85, 6, I cheated. I took screenshots. <laughs> so Psalms 85, 6, uh, this is a psalm, and they're crying out, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in us, in you? 
Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. These were people who once were alive and now needed to be revived. In Habakkuk 2, I mean, I'm sorry, 3, verses 2, it says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. So here's these people. They're God's people all along. So way back to Jacob, there, I, I looked up something, and it said there was 193 recorded revivals, starting with Jacob. And so if people of the Bible, even before the Holy Spirit came, prayed for revival, prayed to be revived, we need the same prayer. We need the same thing. So all through the scriptures, you'll see Old Testament where the people of God walked away. They hardened their hearts toward the things of God. What would cause them to do that? You know, a lot of times it was adversity. A lot of times it could be prosperity. So when people are going through times of adversity, they get confused. Who is God and why isn't he protecting my stuff, my, my people, my family, my all these things? Why is, why is God not doing that for me? The enemy comes to steal your knowledge of who God is and, and what he wants for you. Or prosperity. Sometimes you think you're blessed. God has given you all this stuff, and you have all this stuff you can go do. And, and what the enemy is doing is he's saying, look how successful you are. And now you don't have time to assemble with the people of God because you're so successful. You've got to go do this and this and this, and I can do this. You know, there's a lot of stuff that the enemy, he's trying to steal your soul. That's what he wants. He could care less if you're rich or you're poor. He wants your soul. He does not want you to move for God. He does not want you to be revived and make a difference. All right. Um, so I have to tell this little story. So um, a couple weeks ago, oh, probably about three weeks ago, I was headed back from Grand Rapids, and I was on the freeway. And I had just passed this truck. Um, um, I, I have been a driver with somebody that doesn't like to be behind anything, so <laughs> I'm used to passing things. So I passed this truck, and I'm going along, you know, on the freeway, probably a little faster than the speed limit, um, I have to confess. But anyway, I, all of a sudden I see coming across the road is this mother turkey with about six little turkeys. I'm on the freeway going 80, you know. Right where I was at, it was 75, so I was, you know. My husband, no, <laughs> it's not his fault, it's mine. <laughs> um, so I'm going, oh my gosh, I didn't want to hit, you know, could you imagine hitting a mother and these little tiny babies? I would have been devastated. So I slam on my brakes. I kind of turn cornerwise on the freeway, turn on my four ways, hoping that the people behind me will realize there's something going on. So anyway, as I get slowed down, the mother flies, and the babies, whoosh, and they all got across just as this truck goes, that I passed goes barreling past me. Okay, so I praise God that that happened, that they all got across, and I didn't have to see anything like that. You know, that would have been awful. So about three days later, I'm on my way to work, and I'm on a back road. Here comes a mother turkey <laughs> with these little babies. No, it's miles apart, but... Which they're just little babies, and here they are. And, I, you know, I'm going around this curb. I see them. I hit my brakes, stop the vehicle that's coming this way. Praise God, saw them. They stop. They get across. And I thank God for that. But I just thought, Lord, that's just strange that uh, I would see this twice in a week. And what the Lord showed me is this. He said, the mother and the babies, you watch the babies they stayed close. They stayed close to the mother. If any one of those babies would have straggled, they would have been taken out. But because they stayed so close to that mother, they all got across safely. So that's the same with us. The closer we stay to Jesus, we're going to get there safely, and we're going to get to see the moves of God that he has planned. If they're stragglers, you may be taken out. The enemy may come in and just, you know, pull you farther and farther away. 
So we don't want to be stragglers. We want to stay as close as we can. Um, you know, to keep that picture in my mind, those little turkeys were so cute because that mother is huge, and they're this little, and they're, they're little bodies, you know. <laughs> but man, they were right there, and they were not. They were they were following their mother no matter what, and that's how we need to be with Jesus. And how do you know when you're not? How do you know when you're not when you're straggling? You just start to not see things of God as important. You start to be more about the world and the things of the world and and success. Yes, you lose your joy. But man, when you stay close to Jesus, and Jesus has a way of just bringing, bringing things to us to bring joy, even in adversity. I think, who just talked about that? I don't know. Somebody said that in the circle or something about joy and adversity. We can have joy no matter what. No matter what's going on in our life, we can have that joy. Or we can let the devil confuse us and pull us back and make us straggle. And then hopefully you don't get hit by a car. <laughs> or anything else. True. Um, um, so God wants us to have passion. I love that song. I didn't pick it. You know, stir a passion in my heart. We all are passionate about something. If we ask the Lord, if we ask the Holy Spirit, stir that passion in my heart, he'll do it. Um, if we don't stir that passion in our heart, guess what happens? We become religious and traditional, and we just come to church because it's what I do on a Sunday. I just come to church. I hear a message. I go home and happy that I was at church. But man, when there's a passion in your heart, you want to serve. You want to do the things of the Lord. You want to pray for that person. And when you miss it, because God is preparing us, you realize it. It, it was Karen that realized it. Oh, man, we should have done that. And so next time she will. And so that's what's happening when there's a passion in our heart. When I hear somebody, you know, that's having a bad day, do I just walk away and go, oh, man, they're having a bad day and go pray on my own? Or do I give them encouragement? Do I tell them they're going to make it? Do I, you know anything God wants anything and it's if there's a passion in our heart we'll do that so per, revival can come personally to each one of us and it can also come corporately so when it comes per, uh, personally God is changing my heart he the Holy Spirit is with us every day he convicts us he teaches us and if that's not happening in your life I'd get a little closer <laughs> Because he's constantly trying to revive areas of our life that we've let die and that need revived. Um, so, But when it happens corporately, when God's presence comes into a room thick, men's hearts change. I've seen videos. People break. They cry. They repent. So repentance is a huge part of revival. It's not just being excited for Jesus. It's being revived and alive for Jesus. And repentance needs to come because sin is what separates us from God. And so repentance restores us back to God. And that's why when God comes in a room, that's the first thing that happens. People begin to repent. They want change. They want to, you know, they realize how big and holy God is. And so they, they, they get on their knees and they just, you know, ask for forgiveness. And, and in forgiveness comes just such great grace, such peace, such love. So we want that too. We want not just the personal revival. Personal revival is great. We want corporate revival where God comes in a room because there's people... Um, that come to churches and they don't even know how for they don't know how to reach out to God they know they've been church they know they need to but they don't know how but man when God's presence shows up in a room you know how it just happens um, so what happens next when God can get a people a church full of people revived he can send an outpouring he needs the people revived before he can send the outpouring so that's on us. We need to seek. We need to go for that. Acts 1. Let's go to Acts 1. This is very familiar, but we're going to do it anyway. Acts 
Acts 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they all came together in one accord. We know the story. We've heard the story. They came together in one accord. Jesus told them to go and wait and tarry, and there they were. The thing is, they were revived. Why were they revived? Because they were told that something was coming. How many prophecies have been happening in our world in this hour that something is coming? Something is coming. God has to move. The world's getting darker and darker. It's getting darker and darker. God's going to move because he loves people. He's not moving just because, oh, this, it's, these people want excitement. He's going to move because he loves people. Okay? So here they were. They know something's coming. They went to the room. They're praying. They're tarrying. They're, they're there. They're in one accord. They're revived. God is looking for a group of revived people. And now if we go to Acts 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing w mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, where they were sitting. So here's the move they were waiting for, and it happened. It happened. If he did it for them, he's going to do it for us. We have to prepare. We have to be there. We have to be committed. We have to be passionate. And if we go to verse 37 through 41, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to people, so Peter, so here Peter goes out and, and preaches a message, and, and he says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. I'm going to stop there. I don't know why I wrote to 41. But anyway, I want to ask you, are we, are we living what's been released on the earth? Are we living it? I know I'm not where I need to be. Has anybody ever come into your presence and say, what shall I do? What shall I do? There's coming a time where we're going to be so full of God that people are going to say, what shall I do? This darkness that's covering the earth, people are going to start seeking, and we got to be the ones that have the answer. What shall I do? Repent. There is a holy God, but he loves you. You know, we need to be the ones ready. What shall I do? Why is this so important that the people here get revived, the people in churches get revived, not just here, but all the churches get revived, because there's a lot of sleepy Christians that need to be awakened. How are sleepy Christians awakened? By revival. There's a lot of nominal Christians who think they're Christians, and they aren't really Christians. They take on the name of Christians. We probably have seen in the news where groups of people say they're Christians, and you know, you'll know them by their fruit. They're not Christians. But when revival happens, they have a desire now for the truth. They have a desire now for what they thought they had. And then there's those non-converted people who need radical conversion. That happens in revivals. I don't know about you. I'm hungry for revival. In Acts 13, 36. Now this is where, where the writer is, Paul is writing this, or no, whoever wrote this. Um, I think it was Luke. Luke wrote Acts. Um, where the writer is writing this, he's kind of quoting um, scripture or the story from a psalm. And, and then he says in verse 36, not on the right page. And he said, For David, 
after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. So he was stating there, you know, because David made uh, reference to that uh, he would not see corruption, but they know he was talking about the Messiah. So the writer here in Luke does say for David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried. David, the key important thing to think about is David served his own generation. Are we serving our own generation? Do we see that responsibility? Do I see that responsibility? I have children and grandchildren. If I don't serve my generation, and if I don't seek passionately for revival so that they can know God, and the next generation falls by the wayside, as we see right now, the next generation right now is not running after God. There are some, but we need a revival because if the next generation doesn't run after God, who's going to run after my great-grandchildren? There's not going to be people to run after my great-grandchild. I'm going to cry. If we don't do something, it's up to us to get revived, to get that fire, so that our relatives, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren don't just die in the wilderness because nobody told them. It's up to us. David served God for his generation. Tammy needs to serve God for her generation. You know, I love what I love this church and I love coming. But again, I have a fear of not being here because if God moves, I don't want to miss it. I've missed by timing wise. Not because I did wasn't hungry for God, but by timing wise, I've I've missed the move of God that I wanted to see so far. And maybe that, that was God's plan all along because it makes me even hungrier because sometimes people remember a move of God and they don't hunger for more because they sit in remembrance of what was. But now, because I haven't ever experienced, I'm hungry for what it is. And I have told Pastor Joyce, I'm not missing it. I am not missing it. So like three and a half years ago, and some of you have already heard this, um, and I don't hear, you know, I don't hear from God like a lot of people do. I don't have visions and I don't have all these things like a lot of people do. And it doesn't matter. It's how God works with me. And it's all good. Everybody has their own gifts and the way God communicates. And but one night I was actually spending the night at Pastor Joyce's house because I had picked her up. And rather than drive all the way back to Pentwater, I spent the night at her house. It was a Saturday night. And so I'm in the bedroom and um, upstairs, and then Pastor sleeps downstairs, and um, I just fall asleep. I don't know what time it was exactly when I fell asleep, but um, I hear uh, Tammy. I was like, I heard it. It wasn't like, it was, it, I heard it, but I heard it in Pastor Joyce's voice, and I'm laying there going, what? And then I'm thinking, if it was Pastor Joyce, she'd just come right in the room. She wouldn't stand outside the door and say my name. So I remember the story. And so I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm listening. <laughs> this is all new to me, okay? And so this will make you laugh too. So I hear, stand up, please. So if anybody has been in discipleship class... <laughs> <laughs> pastor will say stand up please and I heard that in her voice I'm like okay so I get up and stand alongside the bed I'm like okay Lord here I am what do you want you know there's this kind of anticipation but fear also like what's going on I don't know what to do so I'm just standing there I don't know what to do it's like all right I gotta pee so I went to the bathroom <laughs> I come back, and I'm standing there. Come back, Lord. <laughs> and I'm just standing there, so I didn't know what to do. And so I laid back down thinking, that must have just been weird, me. you know. And so I laid back down, and as soon as my head hit the pillow, I heard, you are going to be a part of the unprecedented move of God, and you are going to see many miracles. 
Now nobody can take that away from me. And that reignited a passion in me that I will not let go of. I know it's coming. I have no, no doubt whatsoever in my mind that it is coming. And so I just want to give that to you guys also, that it's coming. I'm not one that's going to tell you I heard something I didn't hear. I'm not one that hears things. And so to me, I asked him why it was Pastor Joyce's voice the first two times, the, second time, uh, the third time when he spoke to me, it wasn't. And he said, because it wouldn't freak you out. You would think, you know, you're, you're used to Pastor Joyce's voice. And so I wouldn't freak out. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. So again, I want to close with this. If we don't, if we don't get serious, if we don't get revived, if we don't press into God, we could lose a generation altogether. You know, we need to be, we could lose our own. I don't want to miss it. I don't know about you. So we have to choose the narrow gate. We have to start stirring ourselves up. We have to start poking holes in the ashes so that that fire begins to stir. We need to let the Lord trim us and revive us so we don't miss it. And I, my last thing I'm going to say is appreciate what's here because I've been in a couple churches and I appreciate what's here. God moves. All right. So I'll pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that each one of us, Lord God, desires a new relationship, a revived relationship. You show us dead areas. Holy Spirit, reveal to us where we let things slip, where we've compromised. Lord God, we don't want to lose a generation. Help us to keep that in mind. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a last song.